I had originally planned to do something totally different for tonight in our lesson, but I decided, because of the nature of what's going to happen this afternoon, that this is a very fitting topic for what is going to take place in the Super Bowl tonight. So I hope that this lesson will benefit all of us, and maybe I'll save the lesson that I had prepared for tonight for another time. I'm reminded of a boy, he comes to the preacher at church, and uh, he said to the preacher, he said, so... God made man from the dust, right? The preacher said, yes. The boy said to the preacher, he said, and when man dies, he's going to return to the dust, right? The preacher said, yes. The little boy said, well, look, you should see my room because I don't know if someone's coming or going. <laughs> you know, I saw a sign one time. It said, a dusty Bible leads to a dirty life. I think that could not be any more true. The more comfortable that we become, the more dangerous it becomes. I want us to begin in Revelation chapter 3 tonight. I think Cody did an outstanding job uh, talking about this, uh, I think it was last week. But I want to notice something quickly and just get the overall scheme of what's going on here in Revelation chapter 3, if you'll begin there with me in verse 15. And God says to the church at Laodicea, I know thy works that thou art neither cold nor hot, and I would that thou wert cold or hot. And because thou art neither cold nor hot, but lukewarm, he said, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest that I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing and knowest not that thou art naked and miserable and blind and, and naked, he said, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in a fire. That thou mayest be rich in white raiment, that thou mayest uh, be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mightest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Repent of what? You know, what, what does the church at Laodicea need to repent for doing? Well, the answer is, they need to repent for being too comfortable. You see, it's like they were on the fence. And I, and I hope tonight that I can give this lesson in a way that will be in love, but at the same time, we'll go with our theme for this year, which is the word focus. And it's a perfect fit for what's going to take place. And we're all thinking about the Super Bowl, and we're all going to have a great time tonight, most of us anyway, if you're going to be with family and friends. It's a wonderful time for fellowship. I, I'm so thankful that we have times like this when we can get out of church, we go over to someone's house, we have a great time. But I will tell you this, if we're not careful as members of the Lord's church, we think we have our ticket punched <laughs> and we say, well, all right, I don't have to do anything from this point on. But friend, I learned a lesson tonight that that is not the case. The more uncomfortable that we are, usually the best work we will do and I want to show you that principle from the Bible tonight. So here's what I've got to do for myself. I've got to look deep within my heart tonight and figure out, am I too comfortable or am I reaching out to do things that I've never done before? So I want to challenge myself. I hope you challenge yourself, okay? I can only preach this lesson to me, and I hope that you do the same. So we're going to talk about the church in the first century and what made it uncomfortable. We're going to talk about the eruption of, of persecution. We're going to talk about the effect of persecution. We're going to talk about the extreme nature of the persecution. And we're going to talk about the end of the persecution of the church in the first century. Now, I want us to go to the book of Acts tonight, Acts chapter 8, verse 1. And we're going to spend almost all of our time in the book of Acts because we want to see what happened to the church in the first century. And literally, they were taken out of their comfort zone, and the church exploded. You remember in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, he says, it would go from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the uttermost part of the earth. Well, how did that happen? It didn't happen because they sat around and they, they, they got comfortable. It happened because the persecution drove them to take the gospel to those areas. 
So maybe today, you know, I, I don't know if it's good for us to be persecuted, but I, I will tell you this. It is good for us to get out of our comfort zones as the children of God. I want to say this before I begin. I'm so thankful for so many of you who work so hard in the kingdom of God at Ripley. And I, I would say that probably everyone in this audience tonight is heavily involved in the work of the church here. So I know that I understand I'm probably preaching to the choir tonight. But I want you to know that if you are not heavily involved, maybe you're out on the fringes somehow, that you would sort of challenge yourself in 2019 to be a little more focused. And that's our theme for this year. Let's begin, Acts chapter 8 and verse 1. Saul was consenting unto his death, that is the death of Stephen, a faithful Christian. He has just been murdered because of his faith, and Saul was responsible for it. He was consenting unto his death. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except for the apostles. And devout men, they carried Stephen into his burial, and they made a great lamentation over him. For Saul, he made havoc of the church. He, he entered into every house, hailing men and women, women, and committed them to prison. And therefore, they that were scattered abroad, they went everywhere preaching the word. I think you can see in our lesson tonight, this is really the, the heart of what we're talking about. The more uncomfortable those Christians were, the more the gospel spread. So I don't know if I'll expect someone to come in here and throw us all in prison for being Christians. I don't know if I want that to happen. But I do believe God wants us to get out of our comfort zones and start making things happen. So tonight, will you challenge yourself? I'm going to challenge myself in 2019. I hope that you'll do the same thing. And I am fully persuaded that if every person in this audience tonight made a challenge to say, I will do this thing for the kingdom of God in 2019, that this church will grow. It will happen just like in the first century. Somebody said a house is built by human hands, but a home is built by human hearts. Whether or not our hearts are in it is gonna determine whether or not we make this our home. So I hope that's what we'll do. Let's begin number one. Let, let's talk about in the book of Acts the eruption of the persecution that took place in the first century, okay? So let's back up to chapter four. And what I'm gonna do is we're just gonna move forward and I'm gonna move pretty quickly. So you're gonna have to stay with me. There's probably about eight or nine verses here that we'll notice in a rapid fire fashion, okay? I wanna share this with you before I begin though. Somebody said this is the pessimist schedule. Here it is, pessimist. Sin day. Mourn day, tears day, waste day, thirst day, fight day, and shatter day. <laughs> well, everything in his life is always terrible. You know, he's the pessimist. Well, then you come, you know, and the optimist, and he says, well, it's not so bad. <laughs> I'm reminded of a song by Tim McGraw. Live like you were dying. When I was listening to that song one time, I thought, you know what? I need to do more of that. I need to view life in the fact that I could possibly die at any moment. That's what these Christians were doing. And you know what it caused them to do? It caused them to love the Lord and the church like they never had loved it before. They said, we better get to work because, hey, we may not be here tomorrow. We're going to take the gospel to the entire world. And that's exactly what they did. Look here in Acts chapter 4, beginning in verse 2. Being grieved that they taught much people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead, notice, they laid hands on them and put them in the hold in the next day. They put them in prison. For it was now even tied. You come to chapter 5 and verse 18, it said, they laid their hands on the apostles and they put them in common prison. You want to know why? Not because they broke... Uh, some major law they were committing crime or stealing or committing murder no they were preaching the gospel and they threw him in jail Acts chapter 5 and verse 40 and to him they agreed that when he had called the apostles and had beaten them now wait a minute <laughs> why are you going to beat somebody for preaching the truth it happened all the time in the new testament 
They commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus, and then they let them go. You come to chapter 7 in verse 57, and Stephen is pleading his case before the government just before he is being killed. What does he say? They cried with a loud voice. They stopped their ears. They ran upon him with one accord and they cast him out of the city and they stoned him and the witnesses laid their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. All because of the statement that he made before when he said, you do always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so do ye. He preached to them. He told them they needed to repent And the Bible says that they were cut to the heart. It's interesting the different responses in the Bible when people are are cut to the heart. You know, in Acts chapter 2, it says they were pricked in the heart. And they said, what do we need to do? But in Acts chapter (laughs) 7, when they were cut to the heart, they said, no, we're going to kill that preacher. It's a shame, the extreme nature of what's going on here. Let's go to chapter 9. Look at verses 1 and 2. The persecution was so bad that Jesus stepped in. Now you think about this. It was so bad that he came back from heaven, (laughs) okay? He's already been resurrected. He's already gone back to his father. But he showed up on the scene and he said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It's interesting though. You read in chapter 8 in our text. You remember our text at the beginning? There was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. You come to chapter 9 in verse 1, and it says he was breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord. You know what that tells me? If you persecute the church, you persecute the disciples. And Jesus said, you're persecuting me. Friend, I made a decision in my life that I do not ever in my life, now I may, I may break this, I may make a mistake, but as far as I can tell right now, I don't ever want this to happen. I do not ever want to be responsible for hurting the church in any way. I don't want to split a congregation. I don't want to do harm to a congregation. I do not ever want to be a part of hurting the church because Jesus said, when you do that, we're hurting him. You see, this eruption of persecution is taking place. Look, he said the whole purpose that he did this is to bring people bound, all because they believe in Jesus. Let me give you the last one. Let's go to chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. I want to share with you this poem while you turn there. A horse can pull while kicking. A fact we need, uh, a horse can't pull while kicking. A fact we need to mention. But he can't kick while pulling because it has his attention. Let's imitate the horse and lead a life that is fitting. Pull a load for God and there will be no time for kicking. Working for the Lord is something that is owed. Compared to all that Jesus did, we bear the easy load. The reason why I'm not involved is because it's not in my heart. And today is the day my problem is solved. And today is my day to start. Friend, I've got to ask you, what kind of load are you bearing for the Lord? Jesus says, if you will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. You know what that means? I've got to sacrifice something in my life for the Lord. So I've got to ask myself, what am I doing? I'll give you one more. Acts chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. It's interesting that a young man named James was killed by Herod. It says, now about the time Herod the king, he stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church and he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. There is a persecution happening. It's very real. It is an eruption in the first century. Number two, let's talk about the effect, all right? (laughs) When first century Christians see what's going on, what happens, you know, you would think, oh man, I'm not gonna be a Christian. 
don't, don't, don't go out there and teach the gospel to anybody because, hey, you're going to end up like James. You don't go out there and tell people you're Christians. No, no, that, that old Saul of Tarsus, he will bring you to Jerusalem, have you killed. I'm sure some of that went on, but what I'm seeing in the book of Acts is literally the opposite. <laughs> they said, oh, okay, so you're going to kill me now for teaching the gospel. Well, I'll tell you what I'll do then. I'll go convert about six people and see how many of them you could kill. It, it just exploded. It went everywhere. Notice in your text in Acts chapter 8 and verse 4, it said they that were scattered abroad, they went everywhere teaching the word. Let's go back to Acts chapter 2. We're going to go back again from the beginning and we'll just move our way forward again. This is my favorite part of the lesson because what you're going to see is over and over and over, you see people obeying the gospel, people obeying the gospel in the book of Acts. It, the, the church explodes. Let's begin. Acts 2 41. It's very familiar. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day they were added unto them about 3,000 souls. The Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. From this time until you come to Acts chapter 4, it multiplies from 3,000 souls obeying the gospel, notice, to 5,000. In a very short amount of time. You, you may be talking a week, two, a few days. Who knows? It's a very short amount of time. You move forward to chapter 5, verse 14. Believers were more added to the Lord, multitudes, both men and women. It just, it's exploding over and over and over again. Chapter 6 and verse 7, the word of God increased the number of disciples and multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. A great company of priests were obedient to the faith. One of my favorites is in Acts chapter 8 and verse 12. When Philip went down to the city of Samaria, the Bible says he preached Christ unto them. What you're going to find is in Acts chapter 8 and verse 12, it says, when they believed Philip, preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God, they were all baptized, both men and women. <laughs> I just wonder, I always am curious, by the time you get to Acts 8, how many more thousand obeyed the gospel by that time? From chapter 2 to chapter 4, you've got 2,000 more people. It's an explosion. It moves on in chapter 9 and verse 42. You'll notice the Bible says, it was known throughout all Joppa and many believed in the Lord. Let me give you three more. Chapter 11 and verse 21, the hand of the Lord was with them and a great number believed and turned to the Lord. A great number. You know, I always hear these stories about preachers going to India and converting entire congregations. <laughs> Wouldn't that be something? You go and preach to a denominational group and every single person in the audience came forward and obeyed the gospel? Imagine that. That's what's happening in the first century. Multitudes after multitudes after multitudes. You look at verse 24 of the same chapter. He was a good man, full of the Holy Ghost and faith, and much people were added to the Lord. Did this happen because the church was so comfortable and they had everything easy? What I'm seeing tonight, friend, is the more uncomfortable we, we make things for ourselves, the better it will be. You know, we do this all the time in life. We go get a college education. Then you go back, you say, no, I'm going to get a master's degree, right? You get that master's degree, and after a few years, you're like itching to get back in school. You're like, man, look, I just got to go back, you know? Next thing you know, you graduated at the doctoral level. You think, I finally did it. Some of you have already done that. I've never done that, but some of you have already done that. And you know what? You saw a huge increase in your pay raise, didn't you? Because the path of least resistance leads to the path of least results. A man that gets a doctorate degree, he deserves to get a pay raise, right? Right? You know, if I only got one or two degrees, then I, that's what I need to make. Friend, the path of least resistance has always been the path of least results. Let me give you one more. Let's go to Acts chapter 12 and verse 24. The word of God grew and multiplied. 
there was a, a Sunday school teacher, and she asked her class, she said, look, I, I got to know something. Why did Mary and Joseph not take Jesus with them when they left? She was quizzing them. You know, they talked about how Mary and Joseph, they left Jesus behind. They came back, and they found him teaching in the temple. So she was quizzing them. She said, so why did Mary and Joseph not take Jesus with them? And one little boy he raised his hand. He said, they couldn't find a babysitter. <laughs> well, you know, that wasn't it, but that was what was in his mind. Do you know what this theory that we're talking about tonight, this theory that we're seeing in the first century church, do you know what it will cure? It will cure babysitter Christian syndrome. You know, we, we don't have to, to be like... Uh, you know, thinking that babysitter's Christianity is, is something where we just pick up Jesus on the way to church and then when we get done, the bell rings, you know, or whatever, we go home, we drop Jesus back off. This principle tonight will cure that. And it will make Jesus as part of our whole lives. So I hope tonight, if you remember anything about this lesson as you are watching the Super Bowl tonight, that you say, you know what, I... I really need to think that the end zone is not the comfort zone. That's a place where people are winners. The end zone is a place where the church is a winner. And if we're going to get there, it's not going to be by sitting on the bench. It's going to be by making ourselves uncomfortable. You know, the Bible says they were pricked in their heart, have an idea they were very uncomfortable with what they heard but it caused them to go on. Number three, I'm gonna speed this up just a little bit. Let's talk about the extreme nature of what's happening in the first century. Let's go to Acts chapter 26. I'm gonna make this a little shorter than the others. Let's allow Saul of Tarsus to explain to us exactly what he did to the church. Because later he became the apostle Paul and he's pleading his case before the Roman government and he said, look, at one time, I persecuted Christians too. I get it. I understand why you want to put me to death. I used to do the same thing. Here's what he said. Acts chapter 26 and verse 9. I verily thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Which thing I also did. You see, he said, look, I did it too, just like you're doing to me. And many of the saints did I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priest. And when they were put to death, think about the guilt that this man has to feel for this. Because of me, he said, they were put to death, and I gave my voice against them, and I punished them oft in every synagogue. We went in those churches, he said, we broke them all up. We put them in handcuffs, and we took them to die. I punished them off in the synagogue, compelled them to blaspheme, and exceedingly mad against them, I persecuted them even to strange cities. Christians were persecuted bad. But that's not even the worst of it. I want you to Google the Emperor Nero. Find out what he did to those first century Christians. I want to share with you an article very quickly, and I'm going to move on. Nero set fire to Rome and blamed Christians so that everybody would hate them. He was quite insane. He tortured Christians for his own enjoyment. The Roman historian Tacitus, he wrote, he said, they were dressed in animal hides, they were mauled by dogs, crucified and set on fire to light the streets at night. After Nero, it became a capital crime to be a Christian. Anyone who was a Christian would be put to death. It is said that Domitian killed members of his own family because they were charged with being Christians. The list goes on and on. I, I have a, an article about this big. The nature of the persecution was very extreme. I see Paul's guilt when he writes to Timothy. I can almost picture there is a teardrop on the paper. He said... I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who hath enabled me and counted me faithful, putting me in the ministry, who was before a blasphemer, 
persecuted and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly and in unbelief. He could not figure out why he had done all those things. Finally, the comfort zone is not the end zone because of the eruption of this uncomfortable thing. Because of the effect of this uncomfortable thing that's going on in the first century, because of the extreme nature of it, and because of the end, what it produces, what, what is the end result of the church being very uncomfortable? I think you've already seen it. Let me give you one verse. Let's go to Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5. I want us to begin in verse 41. There was a missionary, his name was H.A. Pearson. And uh, his favorite place to go was Africa. And he would go in, these jung- in the Congo jungle and with these tribal people and live with them and teach them the gospel. They loved him so much. They appreciated the work that H.A. Pearson did. And he was sitting in a room with these tribal chiefs one night He was the only white man in the room. And one of the tribal chiefs spoke in Swahili and he said, this white man's heart is as black as every member and every chief in this room. They loved him. The Lord's work was in his heart and they knew it. It didn't matter what color their skin was. They didn't care, he didn't care. If it's in your heart, you do it. I've got to tell that to myself tonight. So when you think about the Super Bowl, remember, the end zone is for winners. And people don't get there by sitting on the bench. The end result, you see, (laughs) the end result is we're going to fight to win. And you come here in Acts chapter 5 and verse 41, and they departed from the presence of the council. Notice they rejoiced that they were counted worthy to suffer for his name. And daily in the temple and in every house, they ceased not to teach and to preach Jesus. It wasn't going to stop them. And that's what made the church grow. I'm asking you tonight to think that same mindset. There is nothing that will stop me from teaching the gospel. Will you challenge yourself this year? I hope that you will. Tonight, if you've never obeyed the gospel, I want you to know that the Christian life is not an easy road, but it is the easiest road. The Bible says the way of the transgressor is hard, There's still work to do in Christianity, but it's the easiest and most wonderful life you'll ever live, but you've got to challenge yourself tonight. Jesus said you've got to count the cost. Are you willing to do it? I hope you are. If you come tonight, you're believing that Jesus is the Christ, you repent of all your past sins, you confess his name, and you say, I'm going to be baptized to contact the blood of Christ tonight. That's the same thing that they did in Acts 2 when it says they were pricked in their heart. And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, what shall we do? What did he tell them? Repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. If you're willing to do that tonight, God is waiting. Will you come right now as we stand, as we sing?